Well, welcome. Uh, I'd, I'd like to keep this kind of informal. We are going to take the questions at the end, but um, as a former classroom teacher, I like to move around, and they've got me tethered here to the microphone, so that's not too good. But what, what I'd like to do is talk just a little bit about how we in our research projects at WSU are trying to create some synergies between farming and ranching and cattle and so forth. Well, I was really impressed last year when I, when I um, came to this conference. And there was a guy, one of the keynote speakers out there, he, in the big room, he was t from Australia. And if anybody gets it, it's the Australians, how to create these connections between farming and cattle and lives, uh, all kinds of livestock, their sheep and goats and, and whatever. And so I, it, it got me really thinking about, about how well they do. And you know, we're doing better, but I think that we, there's a whole world out there that we can tap into to, uh, to create these, these connections. And so uh, this project that I'm gonna talk about today, Biennial Winter Canola for Silage and Seed, is, is kind of a, that follows that thought process. Okay, so traditionally winter canola is grown, you know, for the oil. Essential three oils, we can go to the store, we can buy that uh, right off the shelf. Uh, canola meal is a really great product. In my world, we can use that as a, and, and so my friends over here are going to talk about, uh, about, you know, different uses, but I, I can use that for protein supplements for the cows in the winter, I can use it for stalkers on corn stalks, I can use it for dairy cows and TMR rations and so forth. Really a versatile product. But the re research emphasis over the last four decades or so has been really how do we grow it for seed. And so uh, my projects, you know, pull, pull in this animal component. Here's, here's a, a table just to give a little bit of a, a uh, idea of the chemical composition. As you see right up there at the top, the commercial canola meal, now that's a solvent extracted product, and you'll see down here at the bottom it's fairly low in fat. Now the on-farm processed canola meals, they're just run through a, a on-farm crusher, and they're fairly high products, and that's why you see that difference in protein, that some of that protein is displaced by the oils. Now on the one hand, the oil provides energy for the animal. On the other hand, the protein is, is what is our first limiting nutrient when we're, when we're feeding cattle and, and sheep and so forth on real low quality forages. So it kind of depends on what you're using it for as to what product. Either, either product's gonna work good, but that's the difference. They're really a low fiber uh, product. That's the NDF and the ADF, neutral detergent fiber and acid detergent fiber. Um, you know, anytime we have NDFs of, you know, 30, that's pretty low. Uh, and a subset of that, just the cellulose and the lignin and so forth is the ADF. And when those are down around 20% of dry matter, those are pretty low too. So uh, very digestible, total digestible nutrients, the TDN running about 75%. So those really nice products. But we're here to talk about biennial winter canola. And so what is that, okay? So what we, what we do is we seed that canola in about August, winter canola. We harvest the forage crop in October. It regrows a little bit in the fall and re, then finishes its, its regrowth in the spring. And then we harvest canola for seed the following year. So we actually get a crop for the cows and we get a crop for seed and oil, okay? So what do we expect with canola silage? Well, if we go back in the literature, we can find it's like 16, 70%, sometimes up to 20% crude protein, which is really high, very low in fiber. So if it's low in fiber, that tells us it's gonna be probably a pretty highly digestible uh, uh, product. Um, 
fiber is not bad in itself because as we know, ruminants can digest fiber. It's just to the degree at which they, they can digest it and how much of what we call anti-quality components like lignification and so forth, which, which are barriers to digestion, how much of that is in there. But from the, this standpoint, canola silage would be a pretty, pretty low fiber, high digestible product. Uh, very high in moisture, and that gives us challenges when we, when we go to ensile it, okay? We have too much moisture in a, in a, uh, a fresh forage that we're gonna try to ensile. That can, um, it can uh, perpetuate bacteria that are, that are not beneficial, not just ones that'll drive down the pH and preserve it, but other things that can make animals sick. So we have to be careful about that. When we also have a really high moisture product like this, seepage can be a problem. Imagine thousands and thousands of tons of silage in a bunker, and you have a really excess wet uh, forage going in there, you'll have gallons and gallons and gallons of seepage coming off. And those are actually, you know, would be pollutants and not good for the environment. So we. So we're gonna look at ways in this research of how to control that. And we might be able to do that with absorbance. There's been some research done at, actually at WSU in the late 1990s looking at absorbance to reduce seepage out of silage. Uh, some of the things they've used for absorbance are layers with, of canola or other, other forages with um, drier feeds you could use. You could use um, wheat straw or wheat straw pellets or haze. You could use newspaper for that matter if it didn't have ink on it. Ink, that gives a whole, nother, a whole nother problem. But in this case, I'll show you, we're gonna use alfalfa pellets. And silane reduces nitrate levels, so if you have a feed that's high in nitrate, which can be a detriment to livestock, and silane's a good way to reduce it, sometimes 30 to 70%. We also, uh, as a general practice, inoculate the silage just like you would corn silage uh, when we put it, put it up in the, in the silos. Also, when I say canola silage could cause scours, I'm not talking about infectious scours as we think of in baby calves, okay? This is more just profuse diarrhea because it's so wet just because of the composition of the feed. But it can be a problem because if, if it's making those cows that washy, you're gonna probably have to limit the amount that you put in the diet to maybe 50 to 60% of dry matter. And I think Randy is gonna talk about you've done some grazing, right? And so maybe you'll have, you can take that to the next step of, of what you've found as far as scours go. Uh, also, sulfur can be an issue with canola. Uh, uh, canola uh, accumulates sulfur at about a half a percent to even up to nearly one and a half percent of dry matter. Now, the nutrient requirements for beef cattle, and also I'm pretty sure, I'd have to look it up, but I think the same uh, toxicity level for dairy cattle in their be uh, dairy NRC is 0.4 percent of, of dry matter. So we need to make sure that whatever we do, we don't exceed 0.4% of the diet when we, when we put uh, uh, any feed into, into the, uh, to a TMR or, or a supplement or whatever. It can cause hemolytic anemia, uh, inhibit trace mineral absorption, for instance, of copper and selenium, and that can have implications on intake, uh, hair coat, repro big one is reproduction. And of course, reproduction is between reproduction and, and feed costs, that's our, our main focus, you know, in beef cows is we've got to cover those two, otherwise we're, we're sunk right from the start. Polioencephalomatia, PEM, it's hydro hydrogen gas formation, hydrogen sulfide gas formation in the rumen, causes lesions in the brain, okay? Uh, cause, you know, symptoms, cows staggering around death because of too much sulfur. And these, these effects of sulfur are cumulative. 
Problem of it is, is that we sometimes have high sulfur waters. Now, I've never noticed it here, but when I lived in Kentucky, every once in a while you turn on the tap and you could smell sulfur. Okay? High sulfur water. I've driven, or I've been down to the Turner Ranch in Oklahoma. Sulfur, Oklahoma. They named the town after it. There's a swamp right in the middle of town. It smells like rotten eggs. Okay? So there is possibilities that you can have have high sulfur in your water and it, and it will be uh, additive to whatever you find in your feed. Okay, so the objectives of our biennial canola study, we're gonna look at the fermentation characteristics and we've just started, I'll back up, we've just started this project last, last summer. Uh, depending on field rates, of nitrogen and sulfur. So we're taking our, and I'll show you what the treatments, the field treatments are, and then we're ensiling based on those nitrogen and sulfur rates. D to determine the effect of absorbance to reduce effluent loss, and th that's going to be, or we've used alfalfa pellets, and to determine the composition of the silage effluent. In other words, what's in it? If we get all this water running off the silage, what's in it, and what kind of problems could that could that lead to? Okay, so here's the field treatments. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, we used Roundup Ready Canola planted in August of 2014, and we'll repeat this in 2015 as well. Eight pounds of pure live seed per acre. The plot dimensions were 11 by 25 feet, and we had four reps per treatment. We had uh, a third of the nitrogen and sulfur applied in the fall. Two thirds uh, will be applied in the spring. Uh, those, those are the uh, uh, nitrogen and sulfur rates, the 100 and 200 rate of nitrogen, 0, 20, and 40 on the sulfur. We want to we wanna track that sulfur to see if there's a problem with sulfur fertilization whoops, in, t in the, in the uh, final product of the, of the feed as well. P and K were based on soil tests. We harvested for the first year about October the 13th of 2014, and we'll harvest again in 2015, October, and we cut it down to about a four inch height. Okay, so the silage treatments, like I said, our silage treatments follow the field treatments for nitrogen and sulfur, uh, with or without absorbents, which are the alfalfa cubes. So we have 12 treatments, four reps, takes 48 mini silos, and I'll show you how those work here in just a second. We inoculate it with a whole lot of, of colony forming units of lactic acid producing bacteria. We pack 10 pounds of forage into those silos, uh, and we put in enough absorbent to increase the dry matter content of that forage to about 30, 35%, and we're starting with approximately 12%. Okay, so a little over 20% of dry matter we have to add to that so the, because typically we shoot for about 35% dry matter when we do uh, uh, corn silage and that's kind of the standard by which all other silages are, are uh, compared. We allow it to ensile for about 45 days. Um, 30 days will work, but we want to be sure we've got, a, got all the all the acid pulled down, or the pH pulled down in the, in the silos. And it really doesn't matter. Um, once you get past about 45 days, if the weather turns bad and we can't empty the silos or whatever, it's stable. It should be good for months, so. Okay, so what, are, what do we want to find out? We want to find out the forage quality. That's chemical composition. We're going to look at protein and the fibers, the NDF, ADF. We'll look at, we'll probably look at fats. Um, we'll also look at the fermentation characteristics. We can tell a lot about how well the fermentation took place by looking at the pH and the different volatile fatty acids. We want to see a good bit of lactic acid uh, uh, in that because that's the, that's the lactic acid bacteria is the one that pulls down the pH and therefore makes it an environment where other bacteria can't grow and it's preserved, okay? Uh, the rates and extent of degradation, we'll, we'll look at those through in-situ degradability. We just take 
the forages. We'll do this after the second year, so we do both years all at the same time. We put them in little bags, samples, put them inside the cows. We can do 24 and 48 hour digestions. We can do a full digestion curve where we do, do five or six different time points and predict the actual um, digestibility rather than just doing it at time points. Uh, we'll, we can do that for fats and the, and the NDF, ADF proteins. And then the other thing that we think is really interesting that we want to look at is does removal of the forage crop affect the, 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 the seed, the oil, or the meal after it's harvested? And you'll understand that a little better as, when I show you the plots here. Okay, the plot harvest, we use a three foot wide forage harvester. This is some of our canola from October, and it comes out looking like a really nice little salad. Smells really good, too. Okay, then what we do is we, is we take that 10 pounds, and it goes into the tube. In the bottom of the tube, we have rocks, a screen. We have to tamp. It's kind of like loading a cannon. We have to pound in 10 pounds and get it packed really tight to exclude the oxygen. And then a cap goes on, and then there's a thing called the bullet. It weighs like 20-some pounds, okay? 28 pounds, I think it is. It sets on the top and applies pressure. Okay, so what that does is that excludes the oxygen. We cap, we cap the top. It has a water-filled vent. Over there on the far right, where that one that has the tube, you can see it's green. That's a clear tube. The, the, uh, Effluent is already starting out of those high, high uh, moisture uh, tubes. And so the ones that had the, the um, absorbent in it, we saw virtually nothing on the first day coming out of the tubes. And so that's where we are right now. The tubes are full. We just, we just got them emptied. We have um, uh, our fermentation analysis back, but basically we're we, have, we don't have our, our forage analysis for the chemical composition or anything ready to go. But that's the status. It's a two-year project, and we're really excited about, about uh, what the possibilities are and what can do for producers. So anyway, uh, I'll turn it over to, to the guys here, and we'll uh, answer any questions you might have in a few minutes. Good afternoon, my name is Randy Etman. I am a fourth generation farmer from the Valley Ford area, which is just south of Spokane a little ways. We uh, live in an area that receives about 18 inches of rain a year. And uh, we have a small herd of cattle along with uh, pretty diversified uh, grain and, and uh, legume and, and we've started adding canola to our rotation. Um, our history there, we've raised a lot of Kentucky bluegrass seed in the past, and, and um, we've shifted away from that right now. And so, you know, we have pretty regular discussions about um, alternative crops and what to add to our um, rotation. Uh, I farm with my dad and my brother, and uh, I have one of my two sons that have come back to the farm at this point in time. My brother has three boys, um, the last of which uh, he just uh, added in, uh, in June. So the uh, fifth generation, there's possibility of five, five sons in the operation. Um, oh, and it's kind of interesting that Don mentioned uh, Australia. Uh, my son there in the um, far side of the picture, Greg, he is currently in Australia. And uh, he's visiting some people that we've met over the years. And uh, one of the persons that he's um, visiting has developed a haying and feed uh, business. And um, they're raising alfalfa and uh, recently added Timothy. And they've got a, a pelletizing or a cubing operation going. And he texted me here a little while ago and he says, Dad, we need to get a cuber and we need to get a, a press for canola and we're gonna take the meal and we'll put it into the cubes with our off quality hay and we're all set. So it's kind of interesting that you'd mentioned that. Uh, we tried our first attempt at seeding a uh, fall canola in the spring, late springtime 
uh, in 2013 was our first try, and we used the um, variety called Amanda at the University of Idaho. It was uh, seeded on the 6th of June at a rate of four pounds to the acre, and uh, this particular photo was taken in August. This um, chart here shows the different animals that we put on there, the different dates, and how long they were on there. And when I added all that up, I, I kind of surprised myself at the value um, that I've, I put on that amount of grazing. And I reran the numbers and I thought, oh, it can't be that high. You know, and I kind of subtract a little bit, but this 80 to $90 is pretty real. I, I, was, I was amazed at that. This is what it looked like in, in September. The cattle really worked it over pretty good. There were a lot of leaves out there, and, and uh, when we first turned them out there, they kind of looked at us like, you want us to eat that stuff, you know? And, and uh, luckily, this particular field here had some eyebrows and rock outcroppings and a little bit of timbered area that had some grass and so forth in it. So they could kind of slowly adjust to eating it, and and uh, it, it gave them the dry matter that they needed for their, for their uh, total ration. This here is a photo of the field that we, we seeded this last spring. We did it in June also. And um, this time we switched to a Roundup Ready um, variety. And we just wanted to have that option to be able to go in and, and control weeds when and if they showed up. I go back to that and discuss this just a little bit. I didn't track the amount of time that we had the animals on this particular field as well as the previous year. We ended up with um, two consecutive mornings we went out and we had a dead cow laying out there um, in this particular instance. And we're assuming nitrate poisoning, but we're not we're not sure. Um, the symptoms looked that way and and. Uh, it was kind of surprising from the standpoint that when we seed this canola, we don't put any fertilizer down with it. We, we intend to fertilize it in, um, after it goes through the winter and put on all of our fertilizer in the spring was our intentions. So it was kind of surprising to think that maybe there was some nitrate poisoning, but it, it could be that the, the plants scavenging nitrogen that's leached down far enough that other crops haven't accessed it. There's another um, little experiment that we did. We had a field that we have seeded to Roundup Ready canola, or alfalfa, excuse me, the year before. This field has about 45 of the last 50 years it's been in Kentucky bluegrass, and it has uh, some low pH areas. It has shallow ground. It probably has residual carryover of several different rather harsh chemicals to try to take out grassy weeds and so forth. So needless to say, we didn't get 100% stand when we seeded the alfalfa. And so we had these thin areas and we were kind of uh, brainstorming as to what to do about the thin areas. And we decided to go out there with a mix of canola and triticale and oats and just kind of run over the, almost the entire field wherever there was um, you know, real good stand of alfalfa, we, we would turn the drill off, but uh, this actually worked out to be a, a rather interesting experiment. And, and so when the, the alfalfa, it was fairly mature when we finally did make hay out of it. it. It had some blooms on it and stuff, but we waited because of the, the weather. So it was uh, July 24th when we were out there swathing it. And <clears throat> You know, we'd been told by a lot of people that canola has such a high moisture content and so forth that it's, that it's hard to make hay out of it. But I think in this particular blend, it actually worked out well. Well, then the next thing was is, are the animals going to eat the stuff? You know, kind of just a, a fairly long stem and large diameter, a few leaves on it and so forth. And, and uh, we fed it to both um, our cattle and my wife raises horses and, and fed it to the horses. and. And uh, 
I'm just amazed, the, especially with the horses. They eat every last bit of it, including the big stems and so forth. So I was really quite surprised and, and it was a, a relatively easy and quick way to spruce up a field that we wanted to make forage out of and, and it increased our yield quite substantially over had we not done anything to it. Some of the observations that uh, I have. The Amanda um, in 2013, that was as close to a perfect winter kill as I think you could, I've ever seen. You really had to look hard to find a live plant the following spring. And I know in talking to some other people that have more experience with raising winter canola, they said that that particular winter was the harshest winter that they've ever had. And, uh, you know, I was talking to some guys that had been raising winter canola for 25 years. So, uh, judging by what I see when I left home to come down here, we have canola that's alive out in, out in that uh, field from 2014. Uh, another observation is, is it's pretty tough to have an entire field or pasture that's 100% canola and get enough other fiber in the cow's diet. Um, we tried it with putting hay out there, but you know, they've got a nice green plant to go chew on. Why do they want to eat dry hay? And so the first year that field that the Amanda was on, like I said, it had, it had grassy areas out in the field and it, and it worked out great. It was just a perfect blend. One of the other ideas that we've had is, is if you're gonna have an entire field and you don't have the option of these grassy strips and eyebrows and that sort of stuff, is I've wondered what would happen if you, if you have your water trough placed at the far end of the field and then you plant an area next to the water trough and coming out towards the canola, if you plant that to something like a forage triticale, and then put the canola on the far end. And they, you know, going to and from the water trough, they're always gonna walk through the forage grain and hopefully, you know, pick up the fiber that they need there. That's one idea that we thought. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about cover crops and I'm kind of wondering whether this method fits the cover crop category um, and, it, and you just don't have to destroy it in the fall, you know, after, after you've received the forage off of it and kind of, or mowed it back or whatever, then goes through the winter and, and I'm thinking that it's going to save a few operations and maybe we'll, we'll receive pretty much the same benefits. Um, obviously we don't have the, the mix of different varieties of, of plants out there, but um, anyway, just kind of an idea. Uh, another observation, and, and uh, I've heard other people talk about this too, is, is that when you first start feeding the cattle, they, they uh, obviously take a little bit of time to get used to it, but it is something that they remember. Uh, the second year when, when we put them out there, they, they took right to the canola and and uh, ate it real well right from the beginning. So, like in our situation, we, we obviously would plant a lot more acres of canola than what we would have cattle to graze. Um, so, I'm wondering if there isn't a way to plant like a Roundup Ready canola and um, plant it with triticale and then at some point in there, cut it for hay, make a dry hay out of it, and possibly if it regrows to the point where you felt there, there was too much growth going into fall that you'd go out there with a mower and mow it off or you know, do something, a mechanical method rather than use, utilizing cattle. But um, once again, that, that hay that's taken off of there would be something that would work for cattle feed. Another thing that I found quite interesting in 2013, this is what, you know, we had some, some late fall rains and this is what the volunteer canola looked like. And with it being a Roundup Ready variety, if a person did have cheat grass or 
some other weeds and stuff that came out there, you know, it's relatively inexpensive to put a, put a little bit of Roundup on it and, and clean it up. Um, so anyway, it's, it, it makes a person think. The, the deer absolutely loved that stuff. It was, it was unbelievable. 500 acre field and, and not exaggerating, I bet you could drive from one side to the other and count 200 head of deer. This particular field is located pretty close to Spokane Valley, so there's not really any hunting pressure or anything that goes on there, and uh, it's just <coughs> unbelievable. So I guess we'll take uh, questions at the end, but thank you. Okay, I need to start out with a few questions for you. So in this, in this audience, uh, how many of you already grow oil seeds? I know Randy does, anybody else? Let me, let me look, 20%? Uh, I need this for the video, I need to tell them what I'm seeing. All right, next, how many people in the room raise livestock? Randy, you're in there, that's yeah, maybe 35% or so. And, uh, and now I'm gonna categorize a little bit. How many have you at least 10, 10 of livestock? And we're gonna assume that's probably the same group of people. Now I'm gonna go a little bit bigger. And how many of you have at least 50 head? Well, that narrows it down a little bit, maybe 20% or so. And then lastly, how many of you are feeding oil seeds to your, to your livestock? Randy's one, you're, you're doing it also. Anybody else? Okay, that's, I'm doing that, so that there's three of us in this room that are doing that. All right, our operation is called Little Canaan Ranch. It's just a small one, We're, uh, we direct market, so it's, uh, we run about 10 to 50 head of cattle. And uh, we, we definitely feed the canola meal. We feed it to our livestock the entire hay feeding season. So from October 15th to April 15th, we're feeding canola meal with our hay. Um, and what we feed specifically is called expeller press canola meal. There's just as, for those of you that aren't aware, there's basically two categories. There's the ones that, there's, a, there's canola meal that's been solvent extracted with, hex, with hexane, and that only has about 2% uh, residual oil in it. And then there's expeller press canola meal, which, as Don was pointing out, can have anywhere from 12% from to 18% oil in it. Um, and we use it because that combination of, of, uh, of, of hay, our hay is terrible. We have um, meadow foxtail for hay, not very good to feed your cattle, but if you add canola meal to their ration, and we're adding it at about 10% uh, of their daily intake, so three pounds per day during nasty weather, um, uh, over the winter. And what we see is that we get great weight gains during the winter time, and um, this allows us to slaughter our beef in February, which is when we like to do it, and when our customers like to do it. And those people would say, well, you know, you're gonna normally do it later than that if you're in the, the custom market, but it really works out nicely. We get the biggest weight gain during that time period. And the real important one, and this is definitely subjective, but the average quality of our beef is higher now than before we started feeding canola meal. We started about five years ago, six years ago, I can't remember quite when, but after we started, we have not had any of our beef come in less than top choice. So it's really, you know, this is, this is not sent out to a lab for testing, but this is just our butcher evaluating it. And he just loves the way our beef looks because of, and it's gotta be the canola meal because that's the only real thing we changed in this whole formula. Okay, so Insanity Strikes. We purchased a canola press. So I don't know if you remember, there was a guy by the name of Victor Kayam in the 1970s. He said he liked Remington Shavers so much he bought the company. Well, we like canola uh, meal so much we bought a press. And I'm gonna show you a video now. This is a description of a process that converts canola seed with, this is a little canola seed with uh, some barley straw in it, to canola meal and canola oil. It starts with a load of canola, 
which you can see here in the back of a dump truck. It is conveyed via this screw auger up into the high parts of the barn. Slides, and there's a motor there, you can see that power cord, and it slides down that chute into the feed hopper. Now the feed hopper has a way scale underneath it that's connected to the computer that runs this process. And when it gets low, it tells that conveyor to turn on and fill the hopper back up. The hopper feeds into a tube, which feeds the canola press. There is a tube coming down through the ceiling, and that is the canola press. So that's a, basically a motor driving a screw that compresses that canola very hard condition, under very harsh conditions. And then that, at the end of it is a heater that heats it even hotter. Now the oil that comes out of it drops straight down through this tube. And I'll try to slide this tube down so you can see. See the oil dripping downward. And then the canola meal goes out through this tube. And I'll show you that in a moment. Now the oil itself is very cool coming out of here. It's only about 75 or 80 degrees. So it's considered cold pressed oil. And the meal is heated up fairly warm, probably about 230 or 240 degrees. And that helps drive out the residual oil. And then um, it goes into a bulk bag. We'll get to that in a moment. But let's go through the oil process. Now the oil drops down this tube into this drum. And uh, I'm going to change this drum to a different type of container so it's a food grade system rather than just an industrial. But basically there's a level sensor on the left which is measuring the level of oil in that tank. And when the oil gets up to a certain level, this pump is turned on by the computer. It pumps it out of the tank through this manifold which watches the pressure so we don't get overpressure. If there's a too high a pressure or too low a pressure, the computer will shut the pump down. The, the oil goes through this filter and from the filter goes up and out through that opening over there. Now there's a little fan there that blows warm office air through a tube that is concentrically around the, the oil tube. And then that, that, that big white tube up there is that outer tube. And it goes over and down, and then I select which of these tanks I put oil into. As you can see, the one on the right is full, the one behind it is full, and now this one is being filled. The canola meal we talked about coming through the wall is feeding down this chute and into this bag, whereas we collect the canola meal. The weight is being watched on that scale over there, and when this, if the weight uh, gets to the certain to the shutoff level, it will shut the system down so that we don't overfill the bag. It'll also watch for abnormal weight uh, gathering. In other words, if the weight doesn't accumulate fast enough, I know there's some other problems, and based on that, I'll turn off the uh, the, the conveyor so that we don't end up with a mess on the floor. So that is a real, real short description of the process. Thank you. So we did that, and then the, the question you have to ask is, well, I ask myself this question a lot. I only use four tons per year. Why in the world would I spend all that money on a canola press? And um, probably don't have real good justification, but I'll try to justify it. <laughs> First of all, it's really important to our business plan. I mean, we feel that it really helps produce good, high-quality beef. And um, we could buy it from Steve Camp, but we really wanted to have it under our own control. So that was one reason. Um, now, this is the geek in me. I automate manufacturing equipment processes for a living. And I've always wanted to do something in my own place. I mean, I've always had some things going automatic-wise, but I wanted to do something more complicated. And this was a really good ch uh, challenge. Because it's one thing to automate a process that you have a, an employee watching all the time. It's another one to have a process that runs 24 hours around the clock without having anybody watch it. And you find out real quickly that you miss a lot of things. And all of a sudden, you have a mess on the floor and a, 
Oh, one time a pipe came loose and the canola just came pouring into the office, the seeds. I had four inches on the floor of the office before I got it stopped. Um, and actually, after all the disasters, it works pretty well now. I have to spend about a half an hour with it every day, just mostly just going out of that dump truck and spreading it around the, the, the conveyor so it stays filled. I can't wait to move it into a grain silo to make it a lot easier to handle. But overall, it was a lot of fun to do. That's, that's another reason. And um, I really do want to help the market grow. And one of the best ways to help the market grow is to invite your neighbors over to see this Rube Goldberg running and offer them a beer and then talk about it. And it's amazing. You know, there's a lot, I've generated a lot of interest. I have a number of people who want to start using canola meal due to this. Now, if I could only have them help me with the oil side of the equation, that would be better. Um, to make this business a success for farmers and for cattlemen and for anybody else who's interested in it, we have to get a good, a good price for both the oil and the meal. The, uh, the oil, if you're trying to sell it for a biodiesel feedstock right now, you're, you're, you've got a terrible business plan. I mean, look at the price of diesel. It doesn't make any sense. You've got to sell oil for at least $2.50 a gallon to even begin to break even in this scenario. And oil for biodiesel must be going at about buck fifty per gallon. I haven't talked to anybody since I've been here, but it, it can't be doing well. So um, it, there needs to be better uses for oil, and that's what I'd like to talk to the university people about. I think there's some things we can do. But then the other thing is I'm trying to help educate cattle people and anybody else who's using it for whatever livestock, that it's worth more than you think it is. It's not just worth, um, well, I'll get to it next, next slide, actually. I mean, that's putting a value on the canola meal. And is it, if, if you, one of the basic ways you can value it is, is what's, what's the protein content? And if it's, you know, whatever its protein content is, that sets its value. But is there something more? And uh, if it's just a source of protein and you use alfalfa, alfalfa being about 18% protein, and in Winton County it goes for about $150 a ton. So, and dairy quality is 200, but we're just going to use uh, regular 150 ton alfalfa. Um, that would mean a canola at 36% protein, which I can't even produce, but let's say it's 36% protein, works out to $300 per ton. So that would be the basic price that somebody would, how they would look at. Uh, and, and it's real easy to convince the cattleman to, to swap this protein source for another protein source. But I, my argument is there's a lot more to it. And this expeller press canola oil is an excellent source of fat. Now as low as 11% and unfortunately in my case it's about as high as 18% because I'm having troubles getting more oil out. Um, but there's a lot of value in that oil. And, and Don touched on this, and that's the extra energy. There is a lot of energy in that oil, and you can adjust your ration to really boost the, uh, the energy for the animal. And um, uh, in addition to that, besides the extra energy, for people in the dairy business, there's a lot of data that shows that the oil cause, increases milk production. Not too important to me in, in the beef side, but for dairy people it would be. Uh, an interesting study was that it increases cold tolerance for newborn calves. Um, if you feed, feed canola to uh, the bread mothers for the last 60 days before, before birthing, they have a lot better resistance to cold. Now, I fall calf, it doesn't matter to me, but if you're a winter calver and it could save the life of one or two of your calves, that might make a big difference. Um, the improved beef quality, I mentioned earlier, that's a subjective opinion. I'd like to see more actual true data on that. And then lastly, Don talked about uh, the omega-6 uh, omega uh, to omega-3 ratio um, being a healthy 3 to 1 in canola oil. When you feed cattle that, it actually comes through in the meat. You can see a difference, and if you analyze for it, you'll find it's got a healthier composition. And that's a real quick through, uh, run through this, and then I just say if you're a, a meal customer or another meal producer or whether you put in your own meal pressing operation or not, please give canola meal a try. You will like it. Thank you. Please. Okay, the question was what did I use for an animal unit value uh, to come up with that 
uh, total dollars per acre return off of grazing the canola. What I did was uh, I kind of used a rough number of about $25 or 25 pounds of feed per day per animal and uh, did a lot like his figures where, you know, compared it against the value of hay and, and just came up with X number of pounds of hay for that number of animals and, and put a value on it as if it was hay as if that was an alternative, if we didn't have that to graze and we had to feed them hay, that's, that's what the value would have been. What do you think of that method? Oh, the question is, do we, will we uh, harvest the crop the following year or are we just using it for grazing and a cover crop? Uh, we intend to harvest it. And what we will do is go in this spring and put on our fertilizer and uh, take it all the way to harvest. And, you know, I know that the, the winter canolas have the uh, potential to produce a, uh, quite a bit more yield than the spring canolas. And so I'm looking for, you know, three quarters of a, of a uh, improvement, maybe a double the improvement. Um, on the yield and couple that with the value of the grazing and and all that I hope that we come out better than raising two crops of of two spring crops or something put together the question was did we see could we um, uh, figure out whether there was damage done to the plant by the animals and no because that never went to to crop we we couldn't tell what the damage was the question was, what did we use for fencing? Uh, we lucked out that both of the fields that we, that we used uh, had permanent fence around them already. And it was of a New Zealand style fence. And we were able then to connect on if we were gonna do some concentrated grazing in certain areas, we were able to hook on with a temporary wire and, and uh, you know, see what some concentrated grazing did versus grazing the entire field. I don't know what, for some reason, we don't have a great deal of uh, problem with the deer on the temporary fence. The question was, is did we ration out the field or, or graze the whole field? Uh, my preference would be to graze the whole field if we could. The challenge there is, is to um, supplement the, the diet with, with some fiber of, of a different source so that they're not eating 100% canola. And... Um, that was the idea that I, that I talked about where maybe half the field gets planted to a, a cereal crop and, and you do it with the strategy that the animals have to walk through the cereal crop in order to get to the canola that maybe then it would blend their diet. But I'm always looking for a way that requires the least amount of labor and management. It'd be nice to be able to you know, turn them out on pasture and, and uh, let them be pretty much self-sufficient. So, Don, my question is on the ensiling. Um, you, you mentioned that you had to inoculate it. Now, when we do alfalfa and we ensile it, we don't inoculate. Do you foresee that we would have to inoculate uh, the canola forage? In, in our project, just to be on the safe side, we are inoculating. A, a, a lot of these bacteria are present in nature. And so it, you may get some benefit, but we just do it as a standard practice, okay? But I mean, silage has been around for eons. I mean, literally, you know, to medieval times. And, and so they didn't have inoculants back in those days, so. Excuse me, the question is, what am I doing with my canola oil? And that is the million dollar question. Um, I've already written off trying to use it as a biodiesel source because of the economics of it. It's fortunate for me, and in my particular case, that the company I work for in Wyoming, it's a uh, company that does water treatment of fracking water. And they have a bioreactor as a part of that process, and they need to uh, use, uh, they need a vegetable oil for foam control. And so they're buying my oil for foam control. That works out very nicely, but I, we need to come up with other uses. It's, it's a great, by the way, it tastes wonderful. 
I don't know if you've ever tasted cold pressed canola oil, but it does not taste like canola oil at all. It's a very fruity type of a taste. But as much as I'd like to sell it as a food grade product, as a matter of fact, I had the, uh, the WSDA DA out and inspected my operation with the new uh, oil collector that I installed after that video was shot. And they said I could be a food grade operation. But uh, we also met with our lawyer. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he said that, uh, you know, you're really going to have to probably carry a specialized insurance for this. And all of a sudden you go, well, if I got to carry $3,000 or $4,000 of insurance to sell this small amount of oil, it really starts to make little sense. So we need help uh, from the point of view of universities of, of saying, what can we do as a deformer applications? What can we do as dust suppress suppressants? I mean, this stuff is going to biodegrade like a bandit, so it's not a bad way to use it. It's just for dust suppression. Mm -hmm. But right now, I'm fortunate. I don't know about anybody else as far as how, what they would do. I know that Steve Camp is using all of his as biodiesel. He runs everything on his farm on biodiesel. Mm -hmm. I've got a quick one for Keith. Um, your farm press canola meal is a high fat product. What, what do you think the shelf life of that is? It's actually very good. Uh, this, this, there's personal opinion and then there's one study that I saw from a PhD uh, thesis out of Italy. And that, that study showed where they stored the canola meal at uh, basically 100 degrees Fahrenheit for a month. And there was no degradation in the, in the canola meal at all during that time period. So, and then for us personally, I've just found that it, it lasts really well. As a sort of a uh, backup plan, I throw a little bit of like a pound or two of dry ice on every bag at the beginning of summer to displace oxygen out of the bag. And that'll, that'll would slow down any oxidation issues. You have to remember that when you cold press canola, there's a large amount of there's a large amount of vitamin E in canola oil, fresh canola oil. That once it's been processed, that a lot of that vitamin E has been destroyed. But when it's when you cold press it, there's still a lot in there, and that some of that vitamin E ends up on the meal side too, and it acts as an antioxidant. So for both the oil and for the meal, there's a large antioxidant present. 